And let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together, Lord, and uh, time to worship you and just spend this time in fellowship together with you, Lord. God, and we uh, pray for your blessing on our morning as we worship you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.
we'll bring it back one that we haven't done in a while.
just that I could stay. You took my place and died. You rose that I could say that you are holy. People say we we love you we love you Lord we love you and we we love you we love you Lord we love you and we Caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus. 
your presence ever. It is such a privilege and such an honor to be in your presence here this morning. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your spirit that lives in us. And Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice, for your love, your great love for us. And God, I thank you for all of us being here. And I pray that your word just sinks in deep today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If our ushers would come forward. Father God, again, I just thank you that we're here once again in your house. Lord, I just thank you for your light that's shining through our windows. Lord, we just thank you for the rain that we've had this week. Lord, that the fires died down. 
and under control. Lord, I just thank you again for just all the blessings that you pour out on us, Lord, in this little church. And Father, I just pray now as we, as this basket comes around, Lord, that we, we just see that as an opportunity to give, Lord, but it's also just an opportunity to receive, Lord, where we receive your blessings, Lord, and then we also give back a part of those blessings. Lord, and as we give our tithes and offerings now, Father, I just pray that you receive them and multiply them. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share with our church family this morning? Christine. Wait. Good morning. I wanted to remind all the ladies about our secret sister that we're going to start this month. Um, so here is a form to fill out all the information about you that you would like to share. We'll trade this information with another person um, randomly, and they will support you in prayer, um, kind tokens, uh, just to keep us seen and um, adored and visible to each other. So if you're interested in participating, fill one of these out, and then we're going to start matching people up, and you'll get your sister uh, next week, okay? And then the other thing I wanted to say was uh, women's group is next November 12th. So that's the next one. Yes, second Saturdays. Second Saturdays. Uh, some of you remember my sister. She's been here several times in the past years. Um, she's the real minister in our family, but uh, she wanted to, she thinks in the, these last days that she wanted to uh, start teaching about Revelation, and so she got a bunch of people together, and she found out that, that Pastor Mike, we were just in, we were just getting the end of Revelation, so she got Brian to make her the whole set and they've, they've actually finished Revelation now. But um, I get, I talk to her two or three times a week, and um, she tells me the blessings that the people get watching Pastor Mike, because not one of the people that she teaches goes to churches that will even touch Revelation. You know, they're, they're theme preachers, they have a, a verse for the day, and they, and, but they don't go into Revelation. And uh, the blessings that these people have I think we're kind of spoiled because we get wonderful teaching here by Mike, and we need to pray for him to encourage him. And uh, right now, they've they, they, she contacted uh, Brian and he sent her um, Romans, so they're going through Romans now. But uh, I just want to tell you, the, there's other people getting really blessings out of uh, of Mike's teaching. And uh, every time I talk to Rosemary, she always mentions that. In fact, when she was going through Revelation, she says, I can't believe he said that today. And he actually taught that two years ago. And, and, and it's happening now and all this stuff. And she was just so amazed. So uh, just be um, appreciative of what we get in this church. is also Pastor Appreciation Month. So thank you, Mike, for all that you do for us. And it's, <laughs> and it's also, it's just so, you know, it is, you, you can't easily take it for granted. You know, in our little congregation here, we just teach verse by verse through the scriptures. And again, so many churches, they just cherry pick certain things. And I mean, you know, when God's word goes out, it's always blessed. You know, God's word is still going out regardless. But we do get uh, somewhat spoiled here in this church, and it's neat now that we've been through the Bible now a couple times. Now, we're on Wednesday nights, now we're starting back in the book of Genesis all over again, you know, and now going through the New Testament here on Sunday mornings. So, again, just, just great. And, again, we don't make the, you know, individual weekly, uh, you know, we, don't, we used to record every, it's still being recorded, but we used to print off the CDs, DVDs, whatever they're called in the back that you can listen to, the audio ones. But if you want one, you can just let us know. There's a little thing you can fill out back there. We can print those for you or any one of the books that Mike has taught through completely. So, so other than that, we have uh, somebody up here to pray with you after service day. If you need prayer for yourself or a loved one, please come up here after the service. We'll have somebody up here to pray with you. And uh, with that also, just keeping in prayer with uh, the Harvest Carnival coming up Monday of next week, a week from tomorrow. So next Sunday after church, we'll need anybody, everybody to help out. We'll 
put this platform up here on the stage, move all the chairs up, and we'll bring all the games and stuff over, set them up, a little bit of work downstairs to move some tables and chairs. And literally with enough help, you know, we can get everything set up in just a, a couple short hours. So it, it's amazing how quickly it goes together. And then uh, Monday, at what time does it start? Six, Six o'clock. So anybody who's helping out, if you could be here at five just for any little last minute uh, preparations and things. And we'll have pizza. Yes. So we'll be a time of prayer, praying for the community. It was neat because I, was it yesterday? Anyways, or maybe it was Wednesday. Anyways, when I was here the last time driving by the church, there was a, a man, a lady, and a little a couple of little kids. They were walking, they were stopping reading at the Harvest Carnival sign. So that just made me feel good that people are seeing it and stuff that are coming out. So... And also with that, we are going to also have popcorn and uh, juice to pass out. In the past, we've done caramel apples and stuff, and it gets, it's a lot of work. But Phyllis is going to make the popcorn. So we need popcorn poppers, not people to pop the popcorn, but popcorn, the plug-in kind, not the stovetop. So if you have one, if you could please bring it with you, that would be great. Phyllis, when do you, do you want to just bring them on Sunday of next week? It would be perfect. And then if anybody wants to help be here earlier that day to help out with anything, let us know too. And let Brian know as well and Jen, you know, if you can be here a little bit earlier to help out with anything as far as the setup. So again, great time. We've literally had, I think the one year we had well over 300 people come through our church with their kids and stuff. So just a great time of fellowship, a great safe place for the kids to be in. And we also still need a lot more candy. I know that bin is full now. It was full last week, but we need to fill it up at least twice more. So Again, we need lots of candy. We got a bin with little toys and giveaways and stuff. So uh, a lot of neat stuff to do with that. And then also, too, again, we have our men's group on the first and the third Saturday of each month at 8 o'clock downstairs. We have a time of breakfast and fellowship. And then, like Christine mentioned, the women's group is on the second Saturday at 10 o'clock. And then our church potluck. So since we got coming up on another first, we have a sign-up sheet, but we're going to do our potluck not on the first Sunday of the month, but we'll do it because of November coming up. November already, is that something? So almost November, so we'll do our next potluck will be the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So it'll be our thanksgiving theme potluck. So we got a sign-up sheet uh, made up already, and I'll start sending that out here probably next week or the week after we'll get people signed up. So, And then I just wanted to mention, too, I, we talked about the Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministries. And uh, I've got, I've ordered some of these, but they just haven't come in yet. So we'll have them soon. We've got plenty of the boxes here. So our goal is we'd love to send out 50 boxes this year. So we'll get the boxes all pre-assembled, set up here. And if you want to fill a shoe box, two, three, four, or five, I'll have these out. And it says basically what to and not to put in them. There's the envelope to put your money in. If you want to just sponsor some boxes with the postage, that would be great too. It's $10 per box is what they ask for. It's not mandatory, but they ask for that to just help cover all the shipping costs and expenses. And then also too, of course, you can uh, you know fill this out. You can track your package, specific package as to where it's going and what country it goes to and that. And with that, I know in the past we've done a lot of, you know, toiletries and stuff, shampoos and candies and different things. But now it's, it's pretty strict and it lists in here the things not to bring, but nothing edible, no candy, nothing liquid or breakable, obviously. But not even toothpaste, you know, the paste and that. So why, I don't know for sure. But anyways, uh, that's all in there, what to do, not to do. And the, the ones I ordered this year, they'll act, actually, instead of cutting out the back for it's a boy or girl and happen to glue it onto your box, they're going to be stickers that you stick on there and stuff, too. So it makes it all that much, and that much more exciting, right? We get stickers. So, all right. Uh, well, that's what I've got. So if everybody wants to just take a brief moment, stand up and say hello, then our children are dismissed. Okay. Also, um, just a side note, the, all the teachings go up on YouTube as well, so you can access those on YouTube, and, uh, and they're there, along with our original songs as well, so uh, that's all up there. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you and uh, praise you for this day, Lord, and um, thank you just for getting us here today, Lord, so that we can uh, hear from you, hear from your word, um, fellowship with each other, Lord. Man, what a joy it is to serve you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our study in um, the Gospel of Matthew called A Radical Life. And uh, we are currently in chapter 22. Oopsie. I don't know what just happened there. There we go. 
There it is. Last time, our message, uh, we finished our three-parter. Uh, by what authority did Jesus do these things? And we said by the Father's authority, by the Son's authority, and by the Spirit's authority. So keep in mind, we're in the final week of Jesus before the crucifixion, and he's still in the court of the Gentiles teaching, and this is on Tuesday of that final week. It's a long day. A lot happens uh, on this day, including the Olivet Discourse where he talks about the end times, uh, which we'll get uh, to in chapter 24. So a lot of things packed into this one, uh, one uh, special day. Um, Today's message is render to God the things that are God's as we study uh, verses 15 through 21 of chapter 22. Remember, Jesus has spent three parables accusing and exposing the religious leaders for what they are. And they did understand what he was saying. They did understand that it was directed at them. Because back in chapter 21, it says, Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. And so now they're launching their counterattack. Because, oh man, he's talking about us and he's making us look bad in front of the people. And so now they're counterattacking him. And they do this by asking him a series of formulated questions. By what authority are you doing what you're doing? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Is there marriage in heaven? Which is the greatest commandment in the Mosaic law? So they're just going to uh, hit him with a series of questions. And so here comes the next one, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you're true, and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Little flattery there, little buttering up, verse 17. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So render to God the things that are God's. So number one in your outlines, Christians should honor and obey God. That's number one, not number two. That two is not supposed to be there. Christians should honor and obey God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. So they had to plot. They had to, uh, uh, you know, devise a plan of how they might entangle him. And that's amazing in and of itself because if you want to entangle me in my talk, piece of cake. (laughs) That's really easy to do, you know. You can entangle me easily. But with Jesus, they had to plot because it was not easy. They could not get him. And so, verse 16, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. In other words, you're not intimidated by anyone. Uh, you'll speak, you, you know, you'll speak the truth no matter what. And so the Pharisees and the Herodians' words are true here, but they're designed as flattery to force Jesus to take a public stand on the issue. And this, of course, would be very insulting to Jesus and to any teacher back then. But they actually thought that they could manipulate him. Like he's, you know, dumb and he doesn't know what's going on. And at the time of Jesus, there were these certain groups. There were the Pharisees, there were the Herodians, and there were the Sadducees as well that held positions of authority and power over the people. And other groups like the Sanhedrin, the scribes, and the lawyers 
or the teachers of the law. Each of these groups held power in either religious or political matters. And the Pharisees were the purists of the nation who opposed Rome. They opposed all attempts by Rome to interfere with the Jewish way of life. They resented having to pay taxes to Rome as an infringement on Jewish law. And they opposed the Roman poll tax for, se tax for several reasons. They didn't want to submit to Gentile power. Caesar was revered as a god, and it was his image on these coins. And they had better uses for their money than to give it to Rome. Much like we feel about the IRS and <laughs> giving our taxes to the IRS. The Herodians, however, were a Jewish, political, pro-Roman group. So they were Jews, but they were pro-Roman. Actually, they were pro-Herod. Herod was pro-Roman because Herod was appointed by the Romans. And they actively supported the rule of Herod's dynasty, and they favored making changes as dictated by Rome. The Herodians favored the tax because it supported Rome. And they favored submitting to the Herods and therefore to Rome for political expediency. So the, Herodian, uh, the Herodians thought that they could change things by their politics, by voting the right person in, so to speak. And they were more of a political group than a religious group, while the Pharisees were more of a religious group. So these two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians, join forces, but yet they're actually opposed to each other. They don't like each other. They hate each other, and yet they're united in their hatred of Jesus. Their motto was, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's how they took it. And Jesus had been doing miracles. He's been exposing them. Uh, he, uh, and it caused some of the people to believe in him for salvation. They were humiliated over the whole thing. And it threatened their power and their position. All three of these groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Herodians, uh, didn't have much in common with each other. They all were opposed to to each other, and yet they were united in their hatred for Christ. Um, back in Mark uh, 3, verse 6, it says, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. And so there's three kinds of people, those who are honoring and obedient to God and to Jesus, those who are apathetic toward Jesus, and those who are opposed to him. The apathetic and the opposers will join forces when they feel threatened. For example, when the Magi came searching for Jesus, the chief priests and the scribes were apathetic. They did nothing. They weren't interested. All they did was answer Herod's questions of where the Messiah was to be born. But that's it. That's all they did. The inactivity on their part was staggering, actually, considering what what. Uh, you know, what, what was being presented to them. I mean, why not go with the Magi just to see what's going on? But they did nothing. They went back to their business as usual, their corrupt business as usual. Herod, however, was in opposition. So they were apathetic, but Herod was in opposition. And it says when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So he was threatened by Jesus' birth, well, that makes sense because he was ruler over uh, the Jews, king of the Jews, so to speak, uh, and so much so threatened that he schemed, of course, to kill the baby Jesus. Herod had no love for the chief priests and the scribes, but they were useful to find out the right information from the scriptures about where Jesus was born. And so as you're reading the scriptures, it looks like all these guys are working together, but they actually hated each other. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Number two in your outlines, Christians should honor and obey their rulers. Verse 17, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this was a controversial subject back then as it is now. 
So they're pulling Jesus into the controversy. You see that, right? They're trying to get him involved in this controversy so that whatever he says will work against him, they thought. If Jesus said yes, the people would hate him because they hated Rome and they hated taxes. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, for the same reason we hate taxes today, and second of all, because it reminded them that they were subject to Rome. But if Jesus said no, he would be accused of being a traitor to Rome. Treason. And, you know, guys, I can't help but think of all the controversies today that Christians get sucked into. So many controversies, things that people argue about back and forth, each person thinking they're right the whole time. And I think these types of things are destroying the witness of the church. I really do. Uh, um, Paul called them disputable matters about doubtful things that we shouldn't be involved in. And the media today is such that you can tune in and only hear the news that confirms what you want to believe. That's how the media is set up today. So you get your favorite networks, your favorite channels, your favorite websites and what have you, and you hear exactly what you want to hear. And in some cases, that's not bad. But in a lot of cases, it does turn out to be bad. And the leader said to Jesus, is it lawful? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And they meant that two different ways, as an allegiance to Rome, but also to the law of God, of God. In other words, is it permissible for the people of God to express allegiance to a pagan emperor by paying taxes? That's what was behind their question. And so they were baiting Jesus, trying to pull him into this controversy so that he could be trapped. And this is what happens when we get sucked into controversies as well. We end up getting trapped. We end up saying things that we shouldn't say and doing things that we shouldn't do. Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus to take care of things at Ephesus, and he warned Timothy, and he said this, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Don't quarrel about words, you know. Uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. See the contrast there. Don't get into arguments about words, but rather handle the word of truth the right way. Avoid godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. When we get sucked into these controversies, we get trapped. And we become more and more ungodly. Are you following that, that train of thought? And then down in verse 23, he says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. Don't have anything to do with these arguments that in the overall scope of things have nothing to do with eternity. Paul directs Timothy to be diligent and take care of his words to rightly handle the word of truth and to avoid those controversial subjects. And man, there are a dime a dozen today. They, there are so many controversial subjects that Christians are getting sucked into. Folks, be warned, don't get sucked into that. Now, there were three regular taxes back then. There was the ground tax, which was a 10% tax on grain production and a 20% tax on oil and wine. There was an income tax, which was 1% of man's income. Boy, I wish that was true today. And there was the poll tax, paid by every man from 14 to 65 and every woman from 12 to 65, and that was a denarius a year, 
called the poll tax. And the poll tax is the tax we're talking about here in Matthew, which was a yearly tax of a denarius. Carson writes in his commentary, paying the poll tax was the most obvious sign of submission to Rome. In AD 6, Judas of Galilee led a revolt against the first procurator because he took a census for tax purposes. Zealots claimed the poll tax was a God-dishonoring badge of slavery to the pagans. The trap then put Jesus into the position where he would either alienate a major part of the popular, popular, population or else lay himself open to a charge of treason. So, verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? He perceived their wickedness, Matthew writes and uh, records for us. You know what that word wickedness means? Wickedness. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. And, and do you know that the word uh, wretched and wicked and witch and wicca all come from the same root word? It's all from the same root word. And he said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? He's calling them out. He knows their deception. They're lying. They're putting on an act, which is what the word hypocrite means. They're buttering him up only to trap him. They're hypocrites, and he sees it plainly, and he confronts them. You hear a lot of uh, hypocrisy from politicians today, right? <laughs> I mean, amen to that. They say one thing, but then they do another, which is a contradiction to the original thing they said. They're putting on an act for the vote. And we need discernment in these times. And of course, we all need to be on guard for hypocrisy because it affects us all. We can all be hypocrites from time to time. It's an easy trap to fall into. So Jesus says, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. Interesting, Jesus had no money on him. Somebody, uh, somebody have a denarius? <laughs> Bring it over here. They probably had a community chest among the disciples, but Jesus and the disciples are not rich at this point. And Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Someone should tell that to the prosperity teachers of today. Verse 20. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so the Roman uh, uh, currency bore the image of Caesar's head. The emperor's head on one side and him sitting on the throne on the other side. And this was Tiberius at this time. And it, it had an offensive uh, um, inscription on it as well. It said, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And on the other side, it said, Divus et Pontifex Maximus, which is God and high priest. So clearly, Caesar was setting himself up as a God, which would have offended most Palestinian Jews, not to mention Jesus. This would have been considered idolatry, a graven image to them. Yet, yet, Jesus doesn't focus on that. He doesn't focus on the fact that it's idolatry. Uh, he's not afraid to look at the coin. He probably even took it into his hands, which would have offended Jews. Because Jesus is not afraid of that, folks, because it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the man, but what comes out of the mouth, because that's an indication of the heart. Exactly. So Jesus wasn't afraid of it. You know, a lot of times uh, when Maggie and I go golfing, uh, which we don't do much anymore, but, um, you know, uh, if it's busy, they'll put us with other people. And so we have to play with other people. And most of the time, those people, their mouths are not the purest in the world. 
you know, especially when they hit bad shots. And, you know, I'm not offended by that. That's where they're at. That's their thing, you know. Uh, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the man. It's what comes out of the mouth that defiles them. So instead, he, Jesus said, uh, took the coin, and he said, the coin uh, bears Caesar's image. Therefore, it makes sense. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. I mean, what a genius answer by Jesus. It would have shut up the mouths of his opponents. Jesus was saying it wasn't a matter of right and wrong in paying taxes. It was a matter of priority. And in their words, the religious used uh, the Greek word didomi, which means to pay. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus used the word apodidomi, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. In other words, pay the debt to Caesar, whatever belongs to Caesar. Pay the debt to God, whatever belongs to God. And so Jesus' words not only answer his enemies, but also lay down the basis for the proper relationship between God's people and government. And Peter got the message. Because later on, Peter says this. In 1 Peter 2.13, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme... Or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Watch this. For this is the will of God. That by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. In other words, serve God in it. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Fear God, honor the president. Fear God, honor the governors. The Life Application uh, Commentary says this, The Pharisees and Herodians thought they could trap Jesus by forcing him to choose between two responsibilities. He stunned them by choosing both. He demonstrated that behind many of our conflicts lies a failure to recognize priorities. Should we give time and attention to our families or our work? Can we communicate our relationship with God through the work we do or by setting our work aside and engaging our fellowship workers in conversation, our fellow workers in conversation? Should we support our church or other worthy causes? According to Jesus' handling of this situation, these problems are issues of timing and priority, not right and wrong. The real challenge for most of us concerns whether or not we are doing what we should be doing at the appropriate time. Citizenship in the kingdom of God doesn't lessen commitments. In fact, it often intensifies them. Marriage duties, parental roles, church involvement, earthly citizenship all take specific place under God's authority. Make sure your commitment to God stays strong, then all your priorities will be under his authority. So Caesar had the right to claim their tax money back then, but he did not have the right to their souls to Jesus, this was the crucial issue. Were they giving their lives to God? Render to God. We focus on the Caesar part. But render to God the things that are God's. Now, of course, when Caesar or any government claims what is God's, then the claims of God take priority over those claims. For example, Acts 4.18 so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, 
nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So in that case, they were being told not to talk about Jesus, and they said, no, we can't do that. They bucked the system. That's an appropriate time to buck the system. Chapter 5, verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So there are times to buck the system, folks. When they're telling, when government is telling us not to talk about Jesus, not to spread the gospel, that's a time to buck the system. But there are also times to not buck the system. Uh, Blomberg writes this, Reasonable taxation is a legitimate function of all governments, even totalitarian regimes. How much more so with more democratic governments? Christians who avoid paying taxes or who avoid paying the full amount of their taxes sin against God even just as surely as in more obviously moral arenas. So Jesus answers with this brilliant answer that would have, you know, quieted them, uh, it was, and, which was completely balanced. So number three, Christians should bear the image of God. Verse 20, and he said to them, again, this is, we're repeating this, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So the question is, whose image do we bear? Whose image do I bear? Whose image do you bear? Is it the image of the world? If it's the image of the world, then where your treasure is, that's where you're going to find your heart. You'll live for the things of this world. But if you bear the image of Christ, then give to God what belongs to him, which is all of you. Give him all of you. Paul said, don't you know that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You know, we're, we're studying the book of Genesis on Wednesday nights again, as Bill said. And uh, we've been looking at the creation account the last two weeks in chapter 1. And over there in chapter 1, it says this, verse 16. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And we talked about this on Wednesday night, but I wanted to expand on it a little bit. And uh, so, you know, if you look at the, the greater light would be the sun, right? The lesser light would be the moon to rule the night. And so these two lights in the sky, but there's a spiritual application here. Because the greater light, the sun, radiates light. It's the source. Uh, it's a source of light. It radiates light. It's the greater light, you see. The lesser light, the moon, doesn't radiate light. It reflects light to the earth. It reflects the light of the sun to the earth. And we, as Christians, reflect the light of the sun, S-O-N, to this earth. But then there's something that happens called a lunar eclipse, and that's when the earth comes in between the sun and the moon. And it blocks the light of the sun to the earth. A lunar eclipse. So the moon grows dark, right, through a lunar eclipse. And we see it go dark in the sky. And that's what happens when the world gets in the way of Jesus and, and us, when the cares of this world get in the way, they block the light and we grow dark. We stop reflecting the light of Christ. But it goes even a step further and 
there's a solar eclipse. And that's when the moon gets in between the sun and the earth and causes darkness on the earth. Likewise, we can turn our backs on Jesus and block the light of Christ from hitting people on this earth. Jesus said, you, I am the light of the world, the greater light. He's radiating that light. He also said, you are the light of the world. We are the lesser light, and we are reflecting his image, if you will. We're reflecting the image of God to this world. And so in Genesis 127, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so again, whose image are we bearing? Is it obvious to people around us? What image are you reflecting to this world? Are you bearing the image of the sun and reflecting it to those around you or bearing the image of this world? Caesar's image was stamped on the coin. But you know, God's image is stamped on you. Now, sin has marred that image a little bit. But through Christ, it can be restored. Colossians 3.9 says, do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according, according to the image of him who created him. And finally, last verse in Matthew uh, 22 that we're looking at in this passage. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. They thought they had had him. They thought that he was trapped, but they marveled and went their way. And the sad part is they marveled and they still went their way. I mean, you think they would say, oh, wow, awesome, Lord. Let's worship the living God, you know. But no, they marveled and they went their way. Man, may that never be true of us. May we ne never marvel at the work of Christ and then just simply go our way. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today, Lord. And uh, wow, so many lessons and so many uh, truths, Lord. And I pray that, that they would all penetrate our hearts. Lord, you've created us to bear your image to this world, to this dark world. And Lord, we want to do that. We want to be those light bearers. You said you are the light of the world. And we just want to reflect as lesser lights, the greater light, the light of the sun, Jesus. May that be true of each one of us, Lord. And as we leave this place, may we leave it um, reflecting that light. May, may it just light up the world around us as we leave this place. And may they see Jesus in us, see his image in us, Lord. And may that be true every moment of every day, Lord. God, help us, direct us by your spirit, Lord. And continue to teach us and to grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Oh.
Never will forget. You never. 
sing you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you No!